Now, I was one of those people who was shocked when you transferred. Um, you know, it, it like, you know, I, I, this is just me looking out from the outside and I'm not like connected to any of the coaches or players like that, anything like that. But just looking at it from the outside and it seemed like Ringe wanted you to be the next Ramil Robinson, Patrick Ewing sort of thing. It seemed to me, it seemed like all the coaches were like, yo, like we want Jaquil Taylor to, you know, be on the, the all time scoring list, et cetera, et cetera. What went into your decision to, I guess, leave Ringe and play basketball at another school? And where did you transfer? Because I, I was trying to, I, 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 should, I probably should have looked that up before, him, but I want to know, like, what, what, was, what was your mindset as far as transferring and where did you end up transferring to? And I guess, you know, what went into that? Well, first of all, it was not my decision to transfer. It wasn't. It was okay. being to be honest. So, but I transferred to Beaver Country Day School because my dad felt like, in order for me to get the to go, in order for me to go where I want to go, I had I had to leave range. Mm-hmm. That's just that's just what he felt at the time. I was like, man, you don't. I'm like, dude, this is kind of stupid. Like, it's that next, but it's like, I don't know. Momo didn't really feel like he didn't really feel like Momo was getting the credit he deserved. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, honestly, the the last the last game we played, the last game I played, I I I played flat out like shit. This is not. I I played terrible. Mm-hmm. My, and my brother was, fr- my brother was freaking balling. Like he, like he was having a game. Yeah. But then he got hurt, so I was like, damn. He's the one who's actually killing right now. And the thing is, no one. And the thing is, everyone saw Momo was killing, but the coaches. No, no shit on anybody, but it's just like, no one really gave him his credit he deserved. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and you know, you know, I'm not gonna throw shade at anyone's names, but you know. You know, bro, a brother's been to a couple of barbershops and I've heard certain things. And, you know, this is not the first time I've heard that they were, uh, they were a lot of very talented basketball players like yourself and your brother who, for one reason or another, were not getting the light shined on them by coaches at Wrench. I don't know why, but that's not, but I've heard this many, many times. And I think, you know, that's, it's really disappointing to hear that because, you know, First off, as a sport, as a big sports fan myself, I hate seeing talent gone wasted, right? And it's one of those things where I don't like seeing bias in sports. Like I think the best guys should play. It doesn't matter, son, daughter, whatever, family bloodline. If that's the best player, you put them in. Um, and um, you know, another thing to go off that is, I've noticed how you know it's it's not uncommon for elite basketball players in high school to the sweet transfer was it a private school. Yes. Yeah. So it's not that's not uncommon for athletes to go from public schools to private schools because private schools tend to more times than not get better looks as far as, you know, going to this school, this school and that school. Now, you said it wasn't your choice to make that transfer as far as it. Excuse me. As far as the transfer going from rinse to there. What was that like on a I guess on a basketball level and a social level? Because obviously growing up in Cambridge, you knew everybody around here. Was it like yeah. what was it like when you went to uh, when you went to uh, the private school you transferred? I forget the name of it again. You said it was Bay something. Beaver Country Day School. Beaver Country Day School. Okay. What was that experience okay. like? That was one of the, one of the tough experiences I've ever had because, like, I mean, as you can see, range you see different people every day. Right. You don't see you don't, you, you won't see the same person every day. It's, what's it like over five thousand students, something like that. Mm-hmm. So you, you'll see someone different every day. Now you may run the same people most of the time, but you, you, you most times you'll, you'll see someone different. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a, like a mini college, if you if you if you would if you would say. Yeah. But like going to be with your day, like the middle school and the freaking high school are attached. There's like five hundred to six hundred students in the school, so everyone nice. knows everything about everybody. Yeah. So it's just like, not to mention it was like a predominantly white and Jewish school, mm-hmm. which is not something I'm really the most comfortable with. So like that first year, my dad, told me, I got, I got changed how I dress, I got changed how I do this, I changed how I talk. I'm just like, why the hell? I'm like, my mom, I'm like, why the hell do I, do I have to change who I am for somebody else? That like that doesn't, I'm not following that. Like mm-hmm. eight, I, I got, I got wear khakis and I, I got, I got wear a polo. I'm just like, dude, I'm not no. I'm not a preppy kid. I'm from I'm from the city. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, I mean, at the time I I didn't understand because like, like dude, I, I I'm not trying to impress none of these people. I don't care about none of these people. Like so, it's like as far as as far as I'm concerned, it's like honestly, who the hell cares what they think about me? Mm-hmm. That that that's what I thought. 
But like, and then honestly, that first year was tough too because I didn't, I struggled academically because the, the school was just, it was more advanced academic than what I expected. And it's just, I, I didn't really fall into the right, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't start off well. I, I, didn't, I didn't start off well. Also, what I, what I did found kind of, I also found this kind of messed up too. People thought I was stupid when I first came. Really? Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. A six ten black dude coming to a prep school, let, 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 a, a, a predominantly white school too. Mm -hmm. So, like, let's be honest. You, you, if you see a six ten and a six seven black dude walk in, chances are you, you're gonna be judged immediately. Yeah, that's the um, moment you walk in. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just like, huh. I'm like looking around. I'm seeing eyes just stare at both me and Momo. I'm just like, okay. You know, th th there's, there's really something to that, right? Because, and I didn't realize this until I left Cambridge to go to college in New Hampshire. Cambridge is one of the most culturally and racially diverse oh, cities sure. in New England. Honestly, I, I would dare say in the entire country, right? It, there's, you know, we the way we talk, the way we dress, everything. We're so unique. You got, you know, you'll have, you got black kids that, you know, you remember freshman year when the, uh, when skinny jeans was a thing and, and the skinny jeans and the flannel era? You was a part of that too. Yeah, yeah you know what I'm talking about. But you know, <laughs> but you had but you have some white kids doing the same thing. But you also have some black kids and white kids that didn't know how to dress at all. You know, they they might dress a little more preppy or maybe they didn't have any swag. But the the the, the reality is, there was so much of that diversity. You would get a little mm -hmm. bit of everything everywhere, so it never felt like you were really an outsider because there was, there was a piece of that pie for everybody. Like I would, whereas, but when I went to college in New Hampshire, a predominantly white school for myself, I didn't realize, like, I wasn't like a hood rat or anything like that in high school. You know me, I, I, I was a yeah. goofy, I was a goofy kid, right? Like, you know, and, yeah, we, and the, we, we both were. Yeah. And, and the thing is, and so I didn't, but when I went, when I, when I went from Cambridge to Colby Sawyer college, that's when I realized how different I am from everybody else outside of that inner city. Like for me, I'm just, you know, another black kid in Cambridge doing whatever out there. I'm basically ghetto. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I, I dress differently. Like I wear, I wear Jordans. Like I can wear skinny jeans when I'm going out, out. Like I dress nice. You'll see me with a chain. You'll see me, you know, maybe a Ralph Lauren, something, you know, something, something like that. But that was so different going out there. And for me myself, like I felt like I always had to think about what I was going to say before I said it, because people didn't understand. I don't even like calling it broken English, but they didn't understand the slang, the, the way that we talk mm. being in the city. Yeah. And that made things really uncomfortable. And I could give you stories for days in depth of what that was like. But, you know, it's little things like I could say, yo, Jaquil, I'm hungry. I'm about to get some grub. You'll know what I'm talking about. I say that to yeah. somebody out there. They'll be like, yo, what's grub? And I'm just like, <laughs> now you, now I feel like an idiot, but I'm like, am I really? Am I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not get like, I, I'm not ghetto. Like I, I go back home. I'm just another, you know, I, I, I can show you what I can show you where the ghetto's at, but it's just, I know what that's like. And just all the eyes are on you now just for being black. And even though people might not say things directly to you, you can see it in the body language and how they stare at you. And it kind of puts you in this cold isolated box. So I know exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to transfer after freshman year. Like that was, that was a really, really tough experience for me. I mean, luckily I had, you know, I had some brothers up there that I was really cool with and, you know, we were tight and what have you, but you know, that's one of those things that I've heard from multiple fellas like us who had to go from the city to go into more predominantly white areas. And it's, it's not just a racial transition. It's the cultural transition too. Cause mm -hmm. you'll see white kids in Cambridge, that are like that identify heavy with inner city culture, black culture, what have you. But even the ones that don't, it's like they still get it. You know what I mean? Whereas like you yeah. out there, it's like yeah, they don't like, get it at all. Yeah, yeah. So it's I, they, I know they don't exactly. Get it. Mm -hmm. And it can be tough to succeed because you know you just want to have fun. You know, obviously you stay out of trouble and play basketball. But now, as a fifteen year old kid, you're getting you're getting you're getting less. A huge culture home. shock. Yeah, yeah. But it's like. Like, I was 18, 19 going through that. You know, like, I'm going two hours away. Like, you're in high school. Like, high school's tough for everybody. It doesn't matter where you go to school. So, now you got to transfer and basically adapt an entire new style of living when you're still trying to 
figure out who you really are. Because that's what we're going through in high school as young adults. We're trying to figure out who we want to be. So, you know, I, I can I can really empathize with what you were going through and, you know,